Hey, we're going to look at John chapter 10, and we're going to talk about the defunding of shepherds, and we're going to see what Jesus says about himself as a shepherd. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper, op the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hears his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This is a figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus said again, Truly, truly, I say to them, to you I am the door of the sheep. And all that came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a sheep shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hard hand and cares nothing about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life and I take up my life again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So Jesus is the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd because he laid down his life for sheep. But there's others. There are thieves and robbers and those that would appropriate the sheep or fleece the flock for their own purposes. And um, when I started out, when I applied for the job at the police department and I was being interviewed, I had a chief that told me that I would find ministry and police work synonymous. And I found that to be true over, um, you know, over the span of three decades. I found that to be true. Many days, many nights, uh, personally, I risked my life and I had other friends that did the same. And I had many friends that did not survive a law enforcement career. Every day that we went to work, every night that we went to work, we knew that it was possible that we would not survive that shift. And I stood by the casket of many a friend that did not survive that shift. There were shepherds that literally laid down their lives. As one who has taken that risk over a protracted amount of time, as one who has stood in the face of crowds, I've had rocks and bottles thrown at me, I've been spit at, I've been attacked, I've been shot at. Having endured that to protect a flock, I take personally some of the things that are going on right now, and even from as a pastor, from a scriptural, as a father, just as a man, as an American, I'm just outraged at the mentality of what's out there right now and just the desperation for us to call truth, truth. And Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Let me tell you the consequences that people are choosing for themselves today. As Austin has decided to, quote, defund the police, and other cities are making the same decision. Let me tell you what defunding is and what's not, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it similar to something else that people don't understand, and that's uh, divorce, okay? People that get divorced make the, make the mistake of thinking um, that by divorcing someone, they delete that person, like they just magically disappear. That's not true. When a divorce happens, you don't make the other person disappear. You just change the terms of your relationship because you're still going to have to deal with them. If you've got kids and share property, there's still going to be uh, a sense of uh, an encounter with that person. You just don't make them go away. It's the same thing with police. You can't disband police. It's impossible. There has to be someone there for emergencies, but you can defund them. You can reduce the budgets and make it more difficult for them to do their jobs. But here's what you do to yourself. When cities defund the police, what they're doing is, is they're uh, reducing funds available for manpower. What municipalities like to do, because 
a police budget is somewhere close to half of a, of a municipal budget on average, is any way they can get into that public safety coin purse. They love to do that because uh, bureaucrats would rather have bridges and buildings named after them. And so if they could get to that money, they can do fun things that they want to do with it other than have public safety. Here's the problem. When you have enough manpower, then shepherds can go out and keep a flock safe. But when you reduce money, you reduce manpower. And when you do that, what happens is police officers, instead of proactively going out and finding problems and solving problems and keep, pe keeping people safe, doing proactive police work, they just become mobile report writers. And so all they do is follow crime and document it. So all they become is journalists. They're not cops anymore. And so what cities have done forever, they didn't want to have a larger police department, is they'll hire bare minimum, and then they'd give overtime for guys to come, the, the, the guys that are new that aren't getting paid anything. And those guys feel like they're getting a gift because they get to work time and a half, and they're like, oh, we're getting to make more money. But they're really kind of getting enslaved. But that's how they double up the manpower and can do the job. When you defund a police department, the first thing that they do is they cut overtime. When they cut overtime, that means you don't have anybody out there anymore. And you can't do the job of keeping the peace and, sh and protecting a flock without shepherds. And so what happens now is your shepherds are merely mobile expediters. They are no longer able to do the job to keep, to prevent crime. Now they just have to document what's already happened. And so there's people that are talking about the defund the police because they want to reduce the idea of authority. They want to do, reduce the idea of the police. What they're actually doing is they're creating future victims. Because in all the years that I did it, the most effective police work we ever did was the proactive police work. When I took a person to jail for warrants, and occasionally I'd be at jail, and I'd have a coworker go, oh, I got somebody for dope. You got him just for warrants. I said, yeah, but warrants isn't all that they're good for. They're also doing this, that, and the other. I know them. I know what they're doing. And by bringing them to jail tonight, there's probably two, three people that are not complainants tonight. So I've precluded crime. Plus, they're wanted. They have business to take care of. So we need to know nomenclature. We need to understand the words that are being used. We need to understand the mentality that's behind them. And you need to understand the heart of people that are putting themselves in harm's way to protect and to shepherd the flock, which is you. It's me. It's all, we are the flock. And some of us are shepherds and are still shepherds, but the ones that are out there taking all the risks and taking all the blame, you make the job impossible, then you're going to create yourself as a victim. That day you dial 911, and they say, we'll be there in an hour and a half to, for you to tell us what they did to you. That's what you're going to get. That's what's going to happen. And that's what's happening nationwide. Jesus said in Matthew 7, after the Sermon on the Mount, those that build their life on my words are building their life on the rock, like a house on a rock. When the storms come, it's going to stand. In this nation, since the early 1960s, since the Supreme Court started diminishing the role and the footprint of Christianity in our nation, has been moving real estate from the rock to the sand decisively, intensively, and consistently since those days. And the more our real estate has been moved from rock to sandy lands, we're beginning to see the beginning now of the erosion and the corrosion and the implosion as a result of those decisions. Your time is short to speak the truth, to tell the truth, to insist on the truth, and to live the truth before you find yourself in unsure footing because you, just have, you have no foundation underneath you. You can still live your life based on the rock if you're living your life based on Jesus Christ. But the storms are coming. And if we're going to enjoy a nation of liberty, if we're going to be a, a, a people of the free, you know, government by the people, by the people, for the people, land of the free, home of the brave, if we're going to be that, we're going to have to maintain that. And we're losing it really, really quick. So tell the truth. Tell the truth about Jesus. He said, I am the truth. The truth matters. The truth matters. In the Old Testament, there's a passage that talked about the sins of the Father being passed down to the Son. And there's a cause and effect to where that's true in a sense. The scripture later, later in the scriptures, God says to the prophet, tell them to quit saying this saying that, that the, the, the father eats grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Each man will be responsible for his own acts, his own deeds. And that's what we've lost in our nation. Nobody wants to be held accountable for anything. Or they want to hold somebody accountable for something that they had nothing to do with. Each man is accountable for himself. We each need to report to God day by day. Micah 6, 8, you know, what, what, 
what does the Lord require of us? That we, you know, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with the Lord our God. There's a lot of things happening around us that we need to be, whatever influence we have, we need to speak up, and we need to tell the truth, and we need to love the truth, and we need to love the Lord. Hey, this last week, uh, Saturday, we saw a young lady come to Christ. This Sunday, we're going to get a baptizer. That's a family that's coming to Christ right now. That's exciting. Her husband came to Christ a few weeks before. Good things are happening. God's moving. Uh, what's God doing with you right now? What's your next mission? Check into home base. Pray. Read the book. Tell the truth. Let's pray. Lord, in a time where the good guys are being called the bad guys, and there have been people that have had positions of trust that have abused them. But Lord, for the most part, we know, for the most part, people are serving in honor and in sacrifice and in excellence. And we pray that the truth will be told and that we will not allow our culture to be eroded from within. That we will stand up for truth and say that we do believe in boundaries, that we do believe in laws and in, in rules of, to, for us to respect one another and honor one another. Let us do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before you. Forgive us our sins and show us what to do in the sandy land that we found ourselves in the middle of, not by our own choice for many of us as we've built our life on you. Let us sustain the storm and let us encourage building on the proper uh, real estate. In Jesus' name that we pray. Have a great weekend. We'll see you for practice tomorrow.